Now, another phenomena is a fatigue failure. What is fatigue? It is a type of failure that occurs in structures subjected to dynamic fluctuating stresses. Means the stress might change uh, from tension to compression, compression to tension back. So, these kind of fluctuations might happen in the stresses and that leads to uh, a failure phenomenon called fatigue failure and this is uh, widely observed in uh, metal structures of about 90 percent of the failure of metallic uh, materials is due to fatigue. Okay? A very, uh, very, very important uh, phenomena when we look at metal structure. So, in case of civil engineering, we have bridges. Definitely, there are steel bridges, steel structures. But the steel bridges are more prone to fatigue failure because bridges are used for vehicles. So, you have moving loads on the bridges, like vehicles when they pass, they, they it is like uh, vibrations are induced onto the bridge structure, and that can lead to this kind of fluctuating stresses which lead to eventual failure. So, here are some examples showing how uh, you know some demonstrations on fatigue related distresses on the bridges. You can see here on the top left this is the uh, bridge over here you can see the steel truss over here and this the, the this figure is the top view of the same bridge it is in Minnesota I 35 bridge which collapsed due to uh, fatigue related failure and also some people say there were lack of redundancy in the structure. But let us focus here on that fatigue because there are reports which says it is due to fatigue failure and you can see another example where there is a 7 foot long crack on a bridge you can see here. Okay? It is a steel girder. Here is another example where there is a crack on the here also you can see another crack on the steel members and here is another crack which you can see on the steel member. So, there are many steel bridges which are vulnerable for uh, to fatigue um, you know failure. And also other industry when we look at aircraft machine components all those also experience uh, severe fatigue uh, related distresses. Now, what are these uh, load where the we just talked about uh, you know uh, variation in the stress from pos, uh, compression to tension, tension to compression. In general, we can classify them as three type of cyclic loading. One is reversed stress cycle where you can see the first uh, graph on the top where it is symmetric in nature along the, this is the uh, axis. So, it is symmetric in nature and that means this height is same as this height here. Okay, the amplitude is same both for compression and tension. You can see the above the graph it is tension and then here it is compression. Okay. Now, uh, for the next case repeated stress cycle here it is not necessarily symmetric like the above case. You can see the graph center line is here or the uh, uh, yeah, the zero stress line is here and then you have compression here and tension. So, you have more tension in this particular case than the compression. So, that is another case and the third case is random stress cycle, cycle which is probably the most common in case of civil engineering structures okay? because most of our loads are not well defined uh, if you are talking about a bridge. You, are, you cannot really well define the type of load, the actual load which is coming on to this uh, particular uh, truss element because that depends on the type of vehicles, the weight on the vehicle, many, many factors uh, play a role on that. But still uh, for design purposes, we try to, uh, you know, uh, we try to design by using three parameters which are mainly the average of the stress then amplitude of the stress and the range of stress. So, these three parameters we consider for design purposes and by approximation of the loads which are coming. So, you can say here this will give me the range of the load here and then maybe I am able to you know uh, model if I, I can model this load pattern and then try to fit it to some kind of equation and uh, you know model it nicely and then 
uh, you can be used that that kind of model and the corresponding three terms like the average and the amplitude and the range of stress can be uh, used. So, here in the second case, I will show you what is the average. So, this is the average line here okay? and this is the amplitude for the uh, compression and then you have uh, this is the total range of the uh, maximum compression and maximum tension. So, all these parameters can be used to design the structures. Now, let us see what is the mechanism which is happening uh, when you talk about fatigue failure. So, you can see on the top right, I replotted the same graph which we used earlier. So, assume that this uh, is the stress strain graph and then fatigue failure can happen at a lower stress level than the actual ultimate tensile strength or compressive strength of the material. Now, you can see here uh, under fluctuating stresses, it is possible for a failure to occur at a stress level lower than the tensile or yield strength for the static load. We are focusing here tensile strength here. So, this can happen at this condition here. That means, the even if the stress is much below the ultimate, the ultimate is somewhere here. So, only six, 35 to 60 percentage, I mean, let me put this percentage here, 35 to 60 uh, percentage of the load if it is there, there is a possibility of fatigue failure to occur, especially in case of steel, typical steel. Now, fatigue failure is brittle in nature, e steel you can say it is a ductile material, but still when it fails, it can fail in a brittle nature. Here I am showing an example of an aluminum piece which is highly ductile as compared to steel, but still aluminum piece which is broken uh, you know uh, by fatigue mode, you can see that there is no really flow of the material here and it just broke into two pieces without really deforming uh, like in usual case, the necking and all that is not uh, happening here. If the same aluminum piece is pulled in a tensile strength test, you might probably see necking and then cup and corn failure, but here you are not seeing that. This is because it is a fatigue induced uh, failure. Okay. So, the total plastic deformation associated with the failure would be very, very less even if the material is ductile in nature. Now, how would the fatigue uh, failure happens? There are three stages, stages for this. Stage 1 crack initiation, that is this here, it happens right here. Okay. And then stage 2 is crack propagation which happens for up to this much distance crack propagation and then the remaining portion is stage 3 okay, or the final failure. Now, if you look at the time taken for all these st initiation of course, it just happens when there is a small crack or something which is happening, but the crack propagation period that will be very long as compared to both the first and third case you will have several uh, cycles to undergo before, I mean all these lines over here indicates one by one cycles, cyclic loading. Okay. So, which could be in millions, uh, you know, I mean here it is demonstrated with very uh, easy to see as lines, but it could, there could be millions of cycles or millions of those propagation, pro uh, crack propagation uh, steps. And then once it reaches some threshold level, then the remaining material fails all of a sudden. This, this happens all of a sudden and very quickly. Okay? So, that is the final failure, the third step. Here is an example for that. You can say this initial crack happened here and then here you have the, uh, the um, propagation phase and then from here onwards it is uh, all of a sudden the final phase. Okay? So, here the smooth region you can see on the top uh, that is the uh, this, this region here is the initiation and propagation region and then this is the third phase here the darker color region. Now, if you look in microscope through a microscope you can see the same uh, you know pattern you see like this over here this pattern and here also you can see um, you know striations depending on the microstructure and the type of loading which is uh, which the material is experiencing. All these small small lines, I mean I draw it very uh, 
you can see a lot of these narrow small small lines here. So, that indicates each loading cycle or a small failure uh, propagation of the failure under each uh, loading cycle. Okay? So, and they also call it uh, beach marks or clamshell marks because it looks something similar uh, to that. Okay? So, you can see here. Anyway, so in microscope, uh, when you look at, you can probably see a lot uh, the millions of cycles uh, that the evidence that it does not happen in just few cycles of loading. Now, how do we take care of this problem in our design? You know, when we design uh, structural systems, uh, knowing that there will be cyclic loading, how do we handle that? Okay? So, there are something called S n curve. S stands for the stress amplitude and the N stands for the number of cycles until failure. Okay? Now, uh, you can see two curves here, one is a red curve and another one is a blue curve. One for the, uh, the red curve for the most non-ferrous materials and the blue one or dark blue for the ferrous or titanium alloys. Okay? So, let us first discuss the ferrous or titanium alloys and then we will go to the non-ferrous material. So, some ferrous and titanium alloys becomes horizontal at higher n values or higher the more the cycle it becomes horizontal. You can see this here, this graph over here it is more or less horizontal after about 10 to the power of 6 cycles. So, from here it is horizontal. right? Now, that is a very good property which the ferrous or titanium alloys have. That limit or the corresponding stress value S e which I am calling or endurance limit or the fatigue limit, it is a stress below which failure due to fatigue will not occur. Okay? So, it is a good thing because if our stress level, if the stress level acting on the material is going to be less than S e for that material for less than S e, then you do not have to worry about fatigue failure. Because no matter how many cycles you uh, have, it is still going to be flat, this curve is going to go like this. So, there is no fatigue failure if the applied stress is going to be below the endurance limit. Okay? That is one thing. Now, uh, let us talk about the, about the uh, non-ferrous materials. Here, there is nothing like endurance limit or fatigue limit. Let us look at the red dot uh, dash arrows there. So, I am going to start from N1. Okay. So, I go upward and reach his, I hit the red curve, let us say some non-ferrous material and now I go leftward and I reach here and that is the fatigue strength which is the stress at which failure will occur at a specified number of cycles. So, my specified number of cycle in this case right now I am discussing is N1. And that means the uh, material will fail when the stress is here. Okay? That means about, uh, you know, let us say there is no unit on this. So, let us say this point A I am going to call or I am going to call S1, N1 and then S1. Okay? Or uh, S0 because I have already another uh, S1. So, now, look at the green. So, this is the case where I am in a design st stage where I know what is the number of cycles which the structure is supposed to, number of load cycles which the structure is supposed to uh, experience or supposed to uh, you know, withstand for. That is N1 and the corresponding, um, uh, let me S1 itself is better, corresponding S1 okay? or the stress corresponding to N1. Now, what I have to do as a designer is that the stress which is going to be experienced by the material should be kept below S1. As long as I do that, 
the system will survive for n1 cycles that is the idea. Okay? So, the load applied load has to be less than S1 load applied has to be less than S1. This is the design stage. Now, let us say you are talking about a bridge or any structure which is already built and you uh, now you want to see uh, maybe there is an increase in the load or something. So, you want to assess the remaining life of the structure. So, what do you do? You know the stress which is applied that is known in, in the green case here the stress is known and I look at the change in the direction of the arrows. Okay? So, you go from here, from here you go to the right and hit the curve and then come down that is about 10 to the power of 6 uh, you know cycles. Now, what we have to do is if this is the load which is applied let us say stress which is applied S A I am going to call or S 1 uh, yeah, S 1 is or S 1 or S A whatever does not matter. So, I am going to make it S 1 itself so that there is no confusion on that. Okay. S 1 now it comes here the green text here it is saying fatigue life at S 1 stress. So, that fatigue life is 10 to the power of 6 or about that. Now, I can say how many cycles the structure has already experienced and what is remaining cycle because I know that if the current load is being applied it will not stand beyond 10 to the power of 6 or approximately that. So, as a, a person who is in charge of that if the structure need to the life of the structure need to be extended what you have to do is you have to reduce the S 1 okay? you have to reduce S 1 and probably start somewhere here and then go further and then make sure that it stand, uh, it gets more life. So, this is the use of this kind of graphs. We can design the structure to resist fatigue load and also we can design the or uh, retrofitting strategies to ensure that the structure really meets the new demand also. So, you might sometimes want to reduce the size uh, uh, increase the size of the column let us say there is a column which is originally of this size and now you have you have to reduce the stress a little bit what you do you put additional column additional column so that the entire load which is coming is going to be half the, because the total load p is same right now p divided by area is the stress so in uh, stress in one and stress in this case two stress in case 1, 1 means only one, 1 of this column and then stress in case 2 will be 2 columns. Okay. Now, when you double the area definitely the sigma 2 is going to be less. So, that means we can actually increase the life by reducing the stress applied. So, this is the whole idea. Okay. Now, these are some examples of uh, SN curves this is for uh, steel uh, you can see this flat region here and then you have alloy which is going down like this and you have nylon which is also going down. Okay. So, looking at these curves we can decide what is the where we can use these curves both for design purpose and for analysis purpose analysis and life extension purposes. Okay. So, the also we just discussed like very simple graphs, right? but when in reality when we actually do this test on various materials there is lot of probability which uh, comes into the picture. As you see on these graphs you can see here in the green one there is this variation, there is this variation, here you have this much variation okay? and in the red one you have this much variation, this much variation, this much variation you can see here. So, how do we handle these variability in the test results? So, we can uh, look at the uh, variation at every point and then draw some probability based curves. So, I am going to show you that in the next slide. So, probability based curves. So, for example, here I can say this is probably the mean value and then the graph is going something like this. That is what I draw here. 
So, there is a mean value associated with the data and then also the probability or the scatter. Okay. Now, these are uh, graphs made based on the type of data which is obtained previously like in the previous slide. Then you draw these different curves associated with different probability of failure 0 0.99, 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Okay. So, you have 5 curves here indicating different probability of failures. Now, focus on the blue dash lines you can see the look at the horizontal blue line. Okay. Now, that I know a corresponding stress is 200 mega Pascal, the corres stress corresponding to the horizontal blue line. Now, I have to see what is the number of cycles at which some probability of failure can be defined. So, for example, if the, if the system reaches about a little bit more than 10 to the power, more than uh, 10 to the power of 6 cycles if when n is equal to about here the probability of failure is 0 0.01 okay i'm talking about this this point here if the number of cycles is here then probability of failure is 0 0.1 i mean the second curve here this this point like that i can find the probability of failure corresponding to different cycles different number of cycle or load cycles. So, when it reaches that particular load cycle, I know that how seriously I should take care of the repair activities or other uh, maintenance activities or retrofitting so that I can still bring the probability of failure uh, down. Okay. Now, look at the, uh, look at the uh, red dot uh, dash lines. I am going the other way where I am putting one cycle here 10 to the power of 7 at that time I can find out at what load what is what, uh, depending on the load or the stress applied what is the corresponding probability of failure. Okay? So, if I want the probability of failure to be very low I have to decide on what is that corresponding stress which I can be I can allow. Uh, uh, I can allow. Okay. So, here you can say 10 to the power of 7 and then corresponding point here and if I want the probability of failure to be very very low 0 0.01 then I have to keep my stress level at this value. Okay. And if I am okay to have a probability of failure of let us say um, 0 0.5 which is not really a good case, but for the, ex the purpose of demonstration I am showing that here the second the one above. So, then I can go for a stress value of that much. Okay? So, about 30. So, this is the use of this uh, kind of probabilistic SN curves. One thing to notice on the horizontal axis you have logarithmic scale forgot to tell you earlier. Okay. Now, there are two when you talk about this variability and all that I think it is also important to know the difference between standard deviation and coefficient of variation. Average you know everybody everything uh, sorry um, you know that average is uh, mu which is sum of all the values divided by the number of values and also standard deviation you have sigma. Now, uh, sigma or I am going to call it S d here for simplicity and C o v is the coefficient of variation. Now, take case 1 here and case 2 here, case 1 and case 2. In case 1, let us say the average value is 100. I am going to show you here which is more important parameter for you to consider okay? and why probably standard deviation is not a good parameter to consider always. So, let us say case 1 average is 100 and standard deviation is 10. What is coefficient of variation? it is 0 0.1 or let us say 10 percentage. Okay? This is equal to 10 percentage. Now, in this case 2 average is 20, okay? standard deviation is 10 and coefficient of variation is 10 divided by 20 that is 0 0.5 that is this case. So, I can call it 50 percent. Okay? Now, you can see in both cases 1 and 2 standard deviation is 10. 
but coefficient of variation is 10 and 50. So, there is a huge difference in the coefficient of variation. So, it is very very important to consider coefficient of variation when you want to compare uh, or look at the error or scatter in the data or variability in the material properties etcetera. It is very uh, important to consider coefficient of variation and not standard deviation always. You can look at standard deviation if the mean values are also in the similar range. If the mean values like here, if they are in the widely separated values, then coefficient of variation is probably a better parameter than the standard deviation. Okay. Another uh, concept which is very important is difference between accuracy and precision. Okay. We sometimes get confused with this. So, here look at this thing, uh, you know, four, uh, you know, dart boards are here. You can see on the bottom left low precision, low accuracy because all these black dots are all over the place. It is widely separated, nothing is close to the center point. Okay. So, that is a case of low precision and low accuracy. Now, here you look at low precision and high accuracy. You see uh, all those black dots are very close to the center point, but not necessarily right on the center. There is still some variability uh, involved in that. So, it is a precision is not very good, but or variability is not very good, but accuracy is very good. Hmm? Now, uh, high precision and low accuracy top left, you see all the black dots are very, very close to each other, okay? but they are none of them are close to the center point. So, that is the case low accuracy, but high precision all are very close to each other. Now, here the fourth one high precision and high accuracy, all the points are close to each other and also they are all very, very close to the center point. So, these are four different cases. I think it is very, this is a very easy way of demonstrating the difference between accuracy and precision. Now, in a sketch a slightly different way, you can see the same thing. When I said precision, I use the word variability. Okay. So, this is kind of the scatter in the data which is available. So, you can see the more the width of this probability density function, this is the probability density function, okay. the more wide the density function is, it is going to be less precision, okay. less precision the more width. Now, if you are talking about accuracy, it is how far the mean value of the calculated values are going to be from the true value or the actual value the distance between the mean and mean. Like if you look at the uh, one uh, on the top left the dot, you can see here, see here the mean of that is very much away from the center point. Okay? So, it is widely separated. So, it is not accurate, but the precision is very good. Because if I draw a graph like the PDF on this, it will come something very close like this, it will come. The PDF will look something like this. So, the PDF is narrow or the width of the PDF is narrow, but it is away from the true value. So, the true value is here and these are the, this thing. So, this is slightly away. Okay. So, you can relate the sketch on the left and right side. 